good to see you all. Um, I wanted to give you a clue about what's happening at the Napa County Library with our H2O Superhero uh, program. We're beginning to wrap up. So if you signed up to be an H2O Superhero on the Learn, Serve, and Protect uh, Napa Valley Waterways on the NapaLibrary.org H2O, uh, if you have been a member and you've been joining us for the last 18 months, believe it or not, um, and attending programs, checking out books, using our library of things to do birding programs and any of those things, um, if you've done five events, you'll get to receive one of these H2O superhero metal bottles that we promised you for attending. So be sure to go in online and mark that you attended this program. And we're asking you to take a survey to help us out with um, what you've learned by watching different wild Napa programs, the birding programs, the cleanup programs. So thank you. And we're really excited because we're coming to a time where we're going to be introducing a new feature on Explore Napa, which is a website that tours different areas of Napa historically. And we'll actually have a tour on there that talks about the, the Napa Valley waterways features, which will include information on the um, uh, rotary screw count for fish. It'll also include information on our water treatment, our reservoirs, and information on some of the wildlife like the beavers uh, that, are, that affect our waterways. So be sure to go on there and uh, uh, appreciate it because we're launching it this month. And I'm so happy to be working with Ashley tonight. I'm going to turn it back to her. Thank you very much. And Anne, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and uh, typing in the um, H2O Superhero website into the chat box. That way, if people want to, they can um, find their way over there. And I would just like to do a little shout out to uh, the Josh Harrington family. That was a lovely dance in the background there. And I hope that you continue to do that throughout the program. It was lovely. Um, so again, my name is Ashley. I'm the volunteer and outreach coordinator here at Napa RCD. And um, we do a lot of things here in Napa County. We're a non-regulatory agency and we offer a lot of technical services um, and volunteer programs and education programs and things like that for all of the people who live here in Napa County. Uh, but what it all comes down to is helping you care for the land, water, soil, and wildlife here in Napa County. For those of you that are recovering from the LNU complex and glass fires, um, if you're looking for resources, please visit NapaRCD.org slash wildfire. There is a survey there that you can fill out. And then when you submit that, it will get filtered into both uh, Napa RCD and NRCS. And then they will figure out who needs to contact you and what your next steps should, um, should be to figure out what, if anything, needs to be done with your, your land. Um, and you can also go to the Napa County um, Glass Fire update page to see any pertinent information that they have available there as well. And I'll put um, all of those resources in the chat box very soon. Um, and if you'd like, feel free to shoot me an email and I can get you added to the Napa RCD email list. We send out a monthly newsletter updating you about, you know, current exciting programs that are happening here in Napa County, um, not just with Napa RCD, but also with some of our partners um, and different organizations that we work with. So feel free to send me a chat and I can um, get you added to that. Uh, the Wild Series, which is what we are here for tonight, is uh, only made possible through support of our partners. And uh, we work with a lot of different partners, but for this particular program, we work with the Watershed Information and Conservation Council, Friends of the Napa River, the Carolyn Parr Nature Center, Napa Valley Vintners, and of course, all the wonderful people, including Anne, uh, over at the Napa County Library. We are continuing to hold lectures right now. Um, there's a lot going on in the world, and you know, Maybe we can provide some sort of relief, um, even momentarily for folks. Um, and a lot of our programs are available, not just on Facebook Live and Zoom while they're happening, but they're also available after the fact. So um, hopefully we can um, offer some resources and a distraction to a lot of folks who might need it at this time. Uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and turn everything over to Napa RCD's uh, Forestry Program Manager. Um, I do ask that we all be very, very kind to Amanda. She has been working nonstop um, in the, I believe, the Incident Command Center for the glass fire. So, um, you know, she's, we asked her to do this a while ago, and she had no idea that everything was going to sort of happen all at once. And uh, we do just ask that you be kind and uh, um, be gentle. So, Amanda, go ahead and take it away. 
Thank you very much, Ashley and Anne. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. I'm really excited to get to talk to folks about forestry and fire in Napa. Um, obviously, we've all been impacted by the current situation going on, um, you know, even still. I know that there are some areas that are still being directly impacted. Uh, evacuations are possible again and power safety shutoffs and all of that. So on that, I'm going to um, start. I will say this slideshow was put together, uh, you know, with a more fire management, fuel management prevention frame. So it's, it's not so much a, you know, these are the risks of wildfire. We all know what that looks like these days. Uh, what we're, what we're really talking about is um, how to how to how to move forward how to how to prevent this from happening again so uh, I also want to say that I know this is a very trying and emotional time for many people and I don't want to be insensitive to personal loss or hardships related to wildfire I want to acknowledge that wildfire can be a hugely damaging event I also want to issue a kind of warning to anyone currently suffering from the effects of wildfire Tonight, we're going to be focusing on fire in forests, and I'm going to be referencing the ecological importance and necessity of fire in a forested landscape. I'll even be promoting the use of fire as a tool for landscape management. I want to say this up front so that no one is blindsided by references to good fire. I want to make it clear that catastrophic wildfire is not what I'm advocating. So with that, thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. Oh, and we'll help. Okay. So forest and fire management in Napa. Uh, this presentation has four main goals. I hope that everyone comes away with a better understanding of the role of fire in forests, what constitutes a fire hazard, how to modify fuel within a forested landscape to reduce those hazards, and how the RCD can help you do that. Fire is a natural process. It's been a necessary process that has made California's ecosystems what they are today. Frequent low intensity fire kept the fuel load low and lessened the mortality from catastrophic wildfires. And in mortality here, we especially mean, you know, tree mortality. Typical characteristics of pre-European forests were open understories with low density, large diameter trees. Obviously there's variation even in those forests you know, major stand replacing wildfires would still come through periodically, but they were far more infrequent, far less frequent than we are currently seeing. Periodic fires kept fuel loading lower. They reduced the germination or recruitment of new plants and shrubs and helped maintain specific ecosystems like meadows and grasslands, which were very important grazing areas for you know, the deer and elk and other large herbivores that have been in this ecosystem for centuries, millennia. Western forests have long been influenced by humans. Native Americans were highly active in maintaining their ecosystems and they maintained those habitats in part with the use of wildfire. Um, cultural burnings or what we today would call prescribed fires was practiced to improve game habitat, promote culturally important plants for food, basket making materials, tools, and increase hunting and defense visibility. Even post-Euro colonization, ranchers in the area still burned. Some ranches in the eastern part of Napa County continue to do prescribed fire for, to this day for the health of the landscape and to reduce risk. And this is a really common practice throughout not just the western United States, but the southern United States, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming in other places too. Fires in Northern California wine country. I got this from the Los Angeles Times. It does not include this year's wildfires. Um, we're looking at the intensity and size increases that have happened since 1950 um, with the Tubbs and Valley and Nun fires all within the last years. And obviously this year we have the LNU lightning complex, which was a combination of lightning and human caused fires. Um, but we're seeing fires in neighborhoods and where humans exist and reside now in a way that we haven't seen in the past. And in part, that's because humans are there in places that they haven't been in the past. We are spreading out 
and we bring fire with us. This is just a real rough graph of fires in the Napa RCD area since 1939. You can see that, you know, every 10, 20 years or so, there were, you know, larger fires. And lately they've been getting uh, more frequent and frankly, more calamitous. The forest types that we have here in Napa County are especially prone and adapted to wildfire. So this slide specifically talks about historic fire return intervals and um, the medium and high. A fire return interval is the average number of years between fires in a specific location. It varies with climate, forest type, and in response to topography. Before European settlement in California, both natural and indigenous fires, indigenously lit fires, occurred more frequently and in more forest types than they do today. You can see the chaparral and oak woodlands there on the right. Um, those have, you know, the chaparral and montane chaparral have much longer fire return intervals. California oak woodlands have much shorter. A fire regime is the characteristic frequency, extent, intensity, severity, and seasonality of fires within an ecosystem. Fire regimes vary regionally in California and shape different vegetation types. So the redwoods are not gonna have the same fire regime as the oak woodlands. And those aren't gonna have the same fire regime as the giant sequoias or the Joshua trees or the Sierras. Um, these are terms that foresters and ecologists use to talk about where and when fire belongs in an ecosystem. So if you look, are oak woodlands a medium fire return interval, which, you know, we can sort of roughly think of like an average was three years. And then if it was a higher fire return interval, it was eight years. So that's, that's a pretty quick turnaround. We're talking about fires on a very frequent scale. And for the last hundred years, we haven't seen that. We've gotten a lot of um, fire suppression done and stop them in their tracks, but in some ways, it's not great. I really like this picture. Um, this is a good example of exclusion of fire from California lands. It's a Bear Creek Fire Guard Station in the Plumas National Forest. So you can see that in 1915, you know, they built that little cabin amongst towering pines and high visibility. And now it is in a dense, thick forest. Generally, the fire return interval for California forest types has been considerably lengthened and has changed our vegetation structure. Fires are ignited, but most are extinguished quickly before they get very big. With this exclusion of fire, we are now seeing a buildup of fuels, both in more trees per acre and in down surface fuels. A lengthened fire return interval affects forest stand conditions, fuel accumulation, and how intensely and severely a fire will burn. When I'm out in the woods, I like to locate where the really large stumps are and try to visualize the sand that used to be there. Obviously, like we talked about, there was variation in those stands. It wasn't all open. You can see in that 1915 picture, you know, there are younger trees in the background, but there are a lot of big ones nearby. It certainly looks a lot different than 2002. These are photos, you know, from just within the last couple years, a combination of land use change and aggressive fire suppression policies over the last hundred years. In addition to hotter and drier summers and shorter winters due to climate change have increased the frequency of large damaging wildfires across the Western United States, California, and here in Napa County. The dramatic increase in the size and severity of wildfires has been attributed in part to large fuel loads accumulating in our forests due to past management and subsequent no management. On the left there, we have a lush green forest that looks beautiful and healthy, but that's a lot of trees. And unfortunately, in the right or wrong conditions, those trees become fuel. If a burning ember from a wildfire gets to that canopy, it's going to hit a crown before it hits the ground. And that means it could ignite the crown on fire. 
in the picture on the right, you might be able to see the sky a little better and an ember might be able to get through there, but there's a lot of fuel on the ground and there's a lot of fuel between the ground and the canopy. So the fire can climb into the canopy and that's how they can spread so quickly. This is a picture of a treatment I did in New Mexico. I was a forester, I was the forester on a large ranch on the New Mexico, Colorado border. So this is right there at the border on the eastern side of the Rockies. Um, we're looking along a drainage. So we have an east and west facing slope, which means different vegetation types, certainly. But the western, western facing slope is the one on the right and that will be traditionally less stocked than the eastern facing slope because it's hotter and drier. We thinned on the eastern facing slope and that picture's about, yeah, two years earlier. You can tell there are already little trees coming back. Um, that flat spot in the front was where we, you know, ran equipment and, and drove big equipment down and there are already little trees coming up. Um, those oak bushes that are kind of red in the foreground are going to be, you know, uh, habitat for quails and um, all sorts of little critters and then also food for bears and turkeys. They love the, the acorns out there. This is a very, you know, to our minds, an extreme treatment. Um, that ranch was large and treating 1,200 acres a year wasn't an issue. I actually wished I could have done more but I only had three loggers. So that's what we could get done. This is another example up there of treatments. This is actually in Colorado. And my favorite thing about this photo is we can see that in the part of the forest where we've thinned, this picture is six months after that job was finished. But obviously it snowed that winter. There's no snow in those trees or under those trees but there is snow on the ground where we took out the trees. So that is that much more precipitation and water making it into the stream below that forest. So there's a canyon down there that had been dry 10 months out of the year. And the year after we did the treatment on that hill slope, it was running for six months out of the year. I'm not taking all the credit for that, but it's a pretty awesome thing to look at how much more water is going to be getting into the creek how much that's going to raise the water table out there. So can we really manage our way out of this? You know, with climate change and everything, it can sometimes feel insolvable. But there are a lot of great examples out there. Every forest landowner in California should be well aware of the warning, it's not if, but when a fire will affect your property. As we've talked about, California's forests have evolved with fire. So living in the forest means anticipating and preparing for fire. We all wish we could live in an old growth forest where fires would just skunk around and clear out the understory. But the reality is there are very few private properties where this is still the case. So what can we do? The answer can be fuel management. This is from the Goat Fire in Lassen County in the year 2000. The area in red, this is privately owned, was thinned in 1990, so 10 years prior. The fire got to that spot and left the crown and went down to the ground. It's, it's not a foolproof, I mean, it's not gonna be the same everywhere, but there are some really powerful examples out there. This is the Megram fire in Humboldt County in 1999. You can see where the untreated area, it ripped through and took out the crowns of you know, all of those trees. And then we got to a spot where it was treated and thinned. And obviously there's still plenty of trees. I don't think anybody looking at the left side of that picture would say, well, that's not really a forest anymore. But if we can thin some of it, you know, this isn't necessarily industrial logging. We're not necessarily talking about, you know, turning everything into tree plantations, but taking an active role in management can help. Fuel reduction treatments do work. 
The treated sand on the left had ladder fuels removed and prescribed fire to remove the surface fuels. The wildfire approached from the right and dropped out of the tree crowns to the ground and underburned the tree stand, but did not kill the trees or badly scorch the crowns. Obviously, high winds can change the way a fire spreads, but a healthy, over, not overstocked forest is more resilient even to ember cast. The trees on the left side of this picture are going to be more health, healthier and more resilient to climate change even. They're not going to be in as much competition there's not going to be as many straws in the ground. They're going to have to, they're going to be getting more water and sunlight and healthier growing conditions than an unthinned forest. So let's talk a little bit about those terms, surface and ladder and crown. Those are what we use in the firefighting world for fuel profiles. Uh, number one in this photo are surface fuels. Those are the down sticks and even trees and logs that can be on the ground in a forest. Um, you know, a, a fairly densely packed forest is going to self prune. So the trees will drop their branches from the lower parts of their stems or bowls. And the surface fuels, you know, will hopefully not be able to reach the crown. Flame length can be as much as two and a half times fuel height. So if you have significant fuel loading, even four feet, you're looking at 10 feet of flame length. I hope I got that math right, guys. Number two in this picture is ladder fuels. Obviously, that dead tree leaning up against the live tree poses a very significant risk. Um, number three is crown, and, and it's just showing a smaller tree there with you know, crowns touching, it could also be considered a ladder fuel. They're, they're very similar in this photo, in this diagram. So the principles of thinning to reduce fuel loading. The before picture there is a very densely stocked forest. There's lots of trees touching, canopies touching, um, you know, dead and live trees all mixed together, small trees leading up to bigger trees. What we want to do is reduce density, so fewer trees, increase spacing, and have fewer larger trees. We don't want to wipe out the next generation. Um, we might even, you know, create a, my very scientific but favorite term for it is gappy clumpy. So we have clumps of smaller trees that will maybe, you know, self thin and the biggest one, strongest tree will take over from that bunch and the others will die out. Um, but we want to have you know, all of the life cycles of the tree represented. We want to increase the spacing between fuels, meaning reduce stand density and give trees room to grow. When you thin a stand out, we call this releasing the stands. The trees are able to grow larger, faster, healthier, bigger, and more likely to survive fire but also insects, disease, and drought. In addition to spacing out individual trees, we want to increase the canopy base height, so that lower edge of the canopy, the distance from the surface fuels to the canopy. We can do this by taking out smaller trees that act as a ladder into the crowns of bigger trees and pruning the lower branches of our residual stand. The bottom line is we want fewer and bigger trees. All right, I want to take a look at some examples. This is a stand that is overstocked. You can see a lot of dead fuels on the ground and a whole lot of ladder fuels leading up to the crown of the dominant trees. This was treated. So the treatment removed small diameter trees, all fewer than 10 inches DBH, which is diameter at breast height, four and a half feet above the ground. So 10 inches at four and a half feet above the ground. You can see how it really increased the vertical and horizontal spacing of the remaining vegetation. A crown fire in normal conditions can drop out of that. You know, a branch lights on fire and it burns itself to the point where it detaches from the tree. It's not necessarily hitting another branch on the way down. It can drop to the ground and then it's just got pine needles. So it's a good example of 
a treated forest area. These are general fuel reduction treatments. On the left is a mastication, so that's done with the machine. And on the right is a hand treatment, so that's done with humans and chainsaws. The goals are the same. We want to thin out small, suppressed, and weak trees, trying to get rid of that wall of forest, most of it dead. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't walk through the forest on the left side of that slide. That poor dog would even struggle. So one term I'm sure you've all been hearing is strategic fuel, or uh, sorry, is shaded fuel breaks. And this is part of strategic fuel reduction treatments on ridges and roads. Um, shaded fuel breaks are fuels, yeah, sorry. Uh, the topo map on the left there has uh, shaded fuel breaks along those ridges. And these are also examples in the photos on the right. What that means is they take the densely stocked forest on top and do the same fuels reduction treatment. Pull out some of those smaller, suppressed, weaker trees, leave the bigger ones that have higher crowns and canopies. There's still young trees under there. There's still room to grow. Um, one of the thought, schools of thought with shaded fuel breaks is to leave it so that the canopy is closed, so that it's actually reducing the amount of light significantly that can get to the forest floor. There are some other thoughts in terms of, you know, creating bigger gaps in the canopy so that fire, if it were to get into the crown, couldn't spread. Um, and it's really just site dependent. And that's going to be, you know, how steep is that ridge? What's the fuel on the other side look like? What, what does your local expert say? So these are uh, examples, the differences between a fuel break and a fire break. I often get the question, Amanda, how big, how big a fire break should I do around my property? And uh, I, I feel like the impulse to ask that question is because people think that if they have a fire break around their property, that the fire is going to stop there and they'll be safe. But that's not actually what a fire break does. What a fire break can do is allow a place for firefighters to get in and create a safe black area. So if I were on a fire in this situation on the, on, in that picture, I might be at that fire break and light a backfire, a surface fire, to reduce the amount of fuel between me and the front of the fire. And then we have a fire break to anchor from. But the fire break isn't going to stop a wildfire in its tracks. The fuel break is going to have more of an impact on how that fire progresses by reducing the amount of fuel over a wide area, but maintaining it as a forest, we can maintain the ecosystem and still have an impact on fires. You know, it, obviously in our high wind scenarios that we're having in the fall these years, the fire is going to jump that 10 foot fire break, no problem. But it is a place for firefighters to be able to make a stand. Here we have examples of fuel treatments in oak woodlands. And this is, I think, so important, you know, especially for Napa. We just love our oak woodlands. It's important to think about the forest type you have when planning a fuel reduction or any type of vegetation management. You want to ensure that any treatment you're pursuing is benefiting the vegetation, obviously. The main example of how good this can be is for oak woodlands. There's specifically deciduous oak woodlands, which are white and around here blue oak, and they are adapted to frequent low intensity fire. Remember, the historic median fire return interval was three years and the high was eight. This was largely due to Native American lit fires to tend the oak stands for acorn production and pest control. A frequent fire would kill off the invasive or at least invading conifers and other evergreen seedlings, leaving an open stand of oaks to grow large with sprawling crowns. These oak woodlands are biodiversity hotspots, hosting over 300 species of plants and animals and are incredibly culturally significant. 
when we exclude fire, all those little dug fur seedlings that sprouted up and are allowed to grow. Dug fur and other conifers grow faster and eventually shade the oaks out. We're currently seeing a decline in our historic oak woodlands and reducing biodiversity in many cases, increasing fuel loading. Where possible, we really should clear these encroaching evergreens to help restore and enhance this fire resilient ecosystem. You know, I, I feel like those pictures just do such a good job of explaining what we're talking about. You can see all of the mostly dug firs growing up underneath those big, beautiful oak trees and then clearing them out and suddenly you have that open, gorgeous oak woodland again. Sorry guys, my dog's drinking water in the background. I hope she's not too loud. So we've done a fuels treatment. What do we do with all the slash? Obviously it depends a little bit on how you did the fuel treatment. If it was a commercial thinning, um, you know, maybe you've, you've taken care of it. The trees were big enough, you did a harvest, uh, were able to sell the trees. But in California, that's a, that's a big process in terms of, you know, making a um, commercial timber sale happen. Cal Fires, you know, the Board of Forestry has to get involved and approved and uh, it takes a lot of permitting and you have to have somewhere to send the wood. And the nearest mills are Lincoln on the other side of the Central Valley and then up in you know, Ukiah and Cloverdale. So it's a harder task. We're working on you know, getting more economic viability out of these things, but still in progress. Uh, otherwise, there are a couple main ways to implement these projects, um, mechanical and hand and cultural treatments. Mechanical work often includes heavy equipment. Uh, mastication is relatively quick and grinds up the slash into mulch. Commercial thinning might be an option. Uh, mechanical work is generally restricted to slopes less than 35 degrees, sorry, 35%, but can go higher depending on equipment, soil type, and operator. As with any mechanical treatment, you need to avoid unstable and sensitive areas, such as areas with certain plants and animals, archaeological sites, springs and other wet areas. Hand treatment is a little lighter on the land. It's more flexible on where the treatment can take place. They can treat on steeper and less accessible areas. Treating the slash is more time consuming. Uh, my, you know, favorite option these days are goats. <laughs> it's uh, certainly the most adorable option. They're restricted to mainly eating the foliage. They're not taking down the big trees, obviously but they can be a good option in really brushy areas. They're all terrain creatures, but operations are limited by where temporary fencing can be set up and water and where they can be contained. So they're really good for clearing out brush, but they might not be able to get in there. If there are a lot of big trees that need to come out too. And then what do we do with all the slash? Um, we can't just leave hundreds of small trees excuse me, lying on the ground without any follow-up treatments that just increases your surface fuels. When reduced fire hazard is your primary objective, you preferably want to pile and burn the slash to get rid of the fuels. You can chip it if you can get it to decompose quickly, if you can, you know, get it into a wet spot or, you know, haul it away, but chipping and hauling are pretty expensive options. Uh, when these are not feasible due to, you know, slope steepness or limited access or financial restrictions, you can chunk the slash up into smaller sections and lay it down as close to contact with the ground as possible uh, to facilitate rapid decomposition. This is referred to as lop and scatter. This option does increase your surface loading for five to 12 years, so you're taking a fire risk there. You want to pull the slash away from the base of any standing tree so if fire does come through, it doesn't cook the inner layer of the trunk, which is called the cambium. This is an example in New Mexico of mechanical treatment in a riparian area. Obviously, the rules are a bit different, but those junipers are invasive trees there and we're really lowering the water table. Let's see if I can play it again. It's called a hydroax, and you can see that tree is just gone now. Obviously, it's a big, wide, open spot, and there's relatively small trees, but those guys could do 25 to 30 foot tall trees. They were pretty impressive. All of that material has just been cast to the winds, um, 
you know, looking at it from afar, you really couldn't tell. You walk up close and sure, they're, they're big splinters, but uh, we weren't too worried about them. Prescribed burning or cultural burning is another tool. Um, this is, option is, you know, has its own problems, obviously. It can be an appropriate tool under the right conditions. Every area is going to burn eventually, so why not try and influence the when and how it burns to meet your specific objectives? It's one school of thought. You can take the time to understand what it takes to implement a prescribed fire and find the right type of help to do it safely. You can work with your neighbors and do larger burns and have a greater impact on the landscape. It's always ideal to you know, the fire does not care about property lines. So we really highly encourage folks to talk to and work with their neighbors. I love to implement, you know, projects that go across multiple ownerships because that's where you're going to have the biggest difference. Um, I had a video on the next slide, but I think I'm going to skip it for now because it's five minutes and I, I want to get through all of these. But it's on our website, and um, maybe if Ashley says we have time, we can, we can go back to it. And really quickly, Amanda, I can also throw that link into the chat box. So if anybody wants to copy and paste that link for later use, um, that, I'll do that. That sounds great. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it just real quick. It's a prescribed fire video that we put together. Um, what we're doing in that video is advocating the use of prescribed fire as a tool for landscape management and hoping to inspire people to build what's called a prescribed burn association. I'm trying to get one started in Napa. Um, I'm not doing it on my own. I just couldn't. It's a group project and it's going to take a lot of people, a lot of hands, a lot of minds, and a lot of hearts to get that one off the ground. Um, so on, you know, the more personal note, the tools we're going to need to get started for any sort of land management. For, excuse me, technical assistance, uh, consulting a registered professional forester. There are not very many of them in California. They're necessary to write forest management plans. I actually just moved back here about a year ago, so I haven't gotten my license yet because COVID means we can't take tests. So I'm working under one of our associate directors, John Henshaw, who is a great guy and a semi-retired registered professional forester. Um, and we're out there trying to write plans for people. It's obviously a little hairy these days, um, but I can certainly consult on forested lands and you know, have been doing a lot of landowner contact. Please feel free to reach out with you know, phone calls or emails. I'm working from home when I'm, not out on fires these days. Um, so I'm trying to try and get back to folks. We have some other RCD folks doing site visits for post fire you know, recovery. And then there's also the Natural Resource Conservation Service that we share an office with. Um, they have some forestry oriented folks and people with a lot of good knowledge. They're also going to know more about cost share programs like EQIP. Um, that's the federal one. And then CFIP is the sort of California equivalent. We have been told by Cal Fire that there's not a lot of funding for CFIP this year, that their budget has gone to emergency measures, which I'm sure we can all understand. Um, I encourage everyone to encourage Cal Fire to spend as much as possible on prevention. It is more cost effective than suppression. There's, and then for Specifically for prescribed burn help, CAL FIRE also runs a vegetation management program, though it's hard to, to get that on the ground with our fire season being so long these days. And then the UC Cooperative Extension Agency is a great resource, and I have another slide in here talking mm -hmm. about them. But for a minute, I want to talk a little bit about the Napa Resource Conservation District. Ashley touched on it, and everything she said is wonderful and awesome. We want to provide assistance to communities to voluntarily conserve, protect, and restore wild and working landscapes. Um, we want to work with ag producers to promote sustainable practices and increase soil health, in-stream habitat, and road upgrades. Nearly 100% grant funded, so we really do rely on our project or on our partners. Um, and our sister agency is the NRCS, and they also have you know a great great impact on the lands. We're all working on this together. 
So what does any of this have to do with a forest management plan? <laughs> what the forest management plan is about is to try and get those goals and objectives for a forest down on paper. We want to talk about what's happened on the land in the past and what we want it to happen on the land in the future. Unfortunately, you know, letting Mother Nature do her thing results in this thing that we're all dealing with these days. So we are land managers. Just being out there makes us land managers, and that means it's our responsibility. Here is the University of California Forest Research and Outreach. They actually have a really quaint series of videos about forestry and forest outreach. Um, they do a lot of really good stuff and their stewardship programs are super informative. There's a lot of really fun, fun parts to all of that. All right. Thanks everyone. That's a picture of me picking up antlers out in New Mexico and Colorado. The elk absolutely loved the treated areas. They'd go there for the, you know, nicer green foliage and the more water and drop their horns off for me. And then that's my dog out on a wildfire. But you know, that's what it did. It burned up that little spot. Those trees are black, but they are very much still alive. And then it ran out of fuel. That grass in the out there in the open was too wet. So it just calmed itself down. And that is all I've got. I will stop sharing and we can start sharing other things. Well, thanks so much, Amanda. Um, we have a, a few comments and, and just a reminder uh, for folks that are on Facebook, feel free to type in any questions that you have into the chat box and uh, well, um, I'm monitoring that and we'll make sure Amanda has a chance to answer them. Um, and we do have a question from Napa RCD board member John. Um, he says, great talk. I would like to hear more about how thinning treatment criteria are communicated to the logging crews on the ground. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's really important that the crews know exactly what the goals are. And a lot of what that is, is talking about the spacing that we want to see and the diameters of the trees that are to be removed and are to be left. Um, in you know, highly sensitive areas, a forester or project manager might go out and mark every single stem that's gonna be removed, or they might, you know, in a less sensitive area, be marking everything that's gonna be left behind. So it's, um, you know, it's really important that everyone's on the same page. I know when I was doing you know, very specific forest management like that in New Mexico, I'd be out on site at least every other day. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Thanks, John. We have a question from Chris Benz. Uh, what are your recommendations for post-fire treatments of burned forest and woodlands? Yeah, we've been getting, we've been getting that one a lot, Chris. Um, we, you know, if you have a specific place in mind, actually on the RCD website, we are setting up, there's a little questionnaire and they're, um, you know, I, now that I'm back on normal work again, I'm trying to do some site visits and go visit people who have been impacted by the LMU lightning complex and the glass fire. So if, if it's that specific, you know, please feel free to get a hold of us on the website, fill out the questionnaire, and we will get back to you about a site visit. In general, I know it's hard, but the biggest rule of thumb is let it be. If it's not endangering your home or your life, if it's not gonna you know, be in the way or cause someone harm, the forest is gonna recover the best if we just stay off of it. And unfortunately that even means not walking around on it a whole bunch. You know, just that little compaction from our feet, you know, walking our favorite trails to see the recovery can have an impact on those trails. Um, the trees themselves, if the leaves weren't all burned off, if they got scorched and are still just there and brown, there's a good chance that tree is going to be all right. You know, the scorched leaves look horrible, but they can come back. Redwoods can come back. Even if they've lost their whole crown, they can come back. Even an oak that, the, like what we think of as the oak tree, even if that part dies, there's a good chance that the roots are still alive and the oak tree will sprout back up from the ground. So I know it's hard, but what we really advise people to do is just pause, take a deep breath, step back and keep hands off for now. 
Um, so Peter from our friend up at uh, Pacific Union College Forest has a question. Um, Amanda, could you please elaborate a bit on what you feel we can do to make commercial timber har harvesting more economically viable here in Napa in order to help private landowners pay for the fuels reduction that a lot of our landscape needs? Do you uh, have any great groundbreaking ideas? Uh, I feel like Peter and I have talked about this before <laughs> and we have yet to break ground on them. Um, you know, there, there are some ideas bouncing around. We've got, you know, the biochar uh, folks. We've got the, um, you know, people who can go out there and, and make, you know, the ashes sort of carbon fuel or not fuel, sorry, carbon fertilizer for, you know, the wineries that might need it these days. So in terms of commercial viability, it's hard because the problem is, is that the stuff we don't want in the forest is not really worth a lot of money in the traditional sense. The mills are far away. We don't have a logging history here in Napa. Um, so we are, we are limited in that way. One of the things we've talked about, I believe Peter and I have talked about, is you know, getting grant programs set up to start a business that could go around and do a portable mill. I really think that in Napa, you know, say we have to thin a couple big trees out of a forest and a bunch of smaller stuff, those big trees could be worth some serious money to folks who want to put in, you know, a sustainable Napa winery post fire and they need some sustainable Napa grown beams for lumber. But, you know, these are, these are one off examples. We haven't solved that problem yet, Peter. <laughs> it's a big problem to try to solve all at once. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from Steve. How do you balance the need to remove and reduce the amount of fuel and the need for wildlife and fish habitat? So what's crazy about it is that, you know, most of the wildlife we have around here is actually happier with less forest. The, they, the, tree, <laughs> the trees, the deer cannot walk through the forests as they currently are in many places. If we can't get through, they're going to have a hard time. So what we're looking at is not reducing the amount of forested land in any way. I don't want to reduce the amount of forested land out there. If anything, I want to increase the amount of forested land. And that means keeping the forest land we have healthier. So pulling out some of the trees within that forest leaving you know clumps of denser trees and creating gaps in that forested landscape just increases the biodiversity when we let douglas fir come in and outgrow all of our native oaks unfortunately we're losing a lot of that biodiversity so by burning and thinning we can actually increase the health and biodiversity of the forests Great. We have another follow up question from john uh, treatments around homes, such as landscape management and building materials sounds really interesting. Have you seen positive results from this season's fires. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten out to the woods for this season's fires. Um, I'm planning on it, but they keep stacking up and I keep doing response stuff. Um, what, what it sounds like is happening out there most is, you know, folks are really concerned when the fire has come close to their home and trees in their, you know, what we consider the sort of landscape or defensible space area have been impacted. So those are major concerns. Um, they are trees, but they're not necessarily a forest. So it's not really what I'm looking at. I highly encourage folks with concerns around their house to call an arborist. Uh, those people are going to be able to tell you, you know, very specifically which part of this tree is alive. I can talk to you about which part of this forest is good and healthy and alive, but uh, the trees are, are a little more specific than I get in general. Great. Uh, next question is from Mackenzie um, over at uh, Napa Land Trust. We've got a lot of friends tuning in tonight, so thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, Mackenzie asks, I've been meaning to reach out about permitting for post fire management. Are permits required for thinning small diameter trees that are returning? Are there any good papers or websites that you could maybe reference? So I think on the RCD website, we actually have some references to this, but Cal Fire does a pretty good job of talking about Cal Fire is the California Board of Forestry. 
Um, it got renamed to Cal Fire in the 90s because fire is, you know, super important and it is, but it's still the Board of Forestry. And those are the folks that make the rules. There are exceptions to the rules for post-fire uh, recovery and, and sort of emergency um, mitigation. And the, the you know, general rule is probably for small diameter post-fire thinning, you're going to be able to get away, uh, not get away, you're going to be able to do the work in the way that needs to be done. <laughs> Um, you know, CEQA is the hurdle that we have to face for everything, and there are a lot of exceptions for uh, recovery and mitigation efforts. And you are correct, Amanda. There is a form um, from Cal Fire on our website that talks about, um, Mackenzie is referencing in particular Doug Furs, which is, you know, a big one that we have here that comes back after fire. But we do have a document on that, naparcd.org slash wildfire. It's from Cal Fire, and it kind of goes through when do you need a permit and when do you not need a permit? Cool. Um, next question is from Chris. Do you know anything about giving carbon credits to landowners for responsible forest management? Nature Conservancy and American Forests are developing a program in Pennsylvania. Is there something like that around here? That's a really good question, Chris. I haven't heard of anything like that around here. Um, you know, the carbon credits are really I personally, I think great idea that unfortunately has been a bit misapplied and I should preface all of this by saying that I'm mostly speaking for myself and not for the Napa Resource Conservation District right now. Um, but there, you know, there are papers out there talking about how the forests that were protected, I'm doing air quotes, protected with carbon credits were maybe not in danger in the first place. Um, so it, you know, there, there are some, there are some issues there. And unfortunately, what the carbon credits end up being is just praising or, you know, crediting anyone for not doing anything for, for any, every stem is, um, counts. And then when that forest becomes unhealthy and dies off due to insects or disease or drought or has a massive wildfire, we as a society and a you know, species, not to mention all the other species, lose all of those carbon credits. So I, th I think there's a lot of work to be done on fixing our carbon credit system. I'll put it that way. That was a very great way to sort of <laughs> skirt around that problem, uh, that question. Uh, question from Josh. Um, how do you and Indigenous peoples engage with each other in the management practices that you're using here in Napa County? So, uh, Unfortunately, you know, I just, I just started about a year ago and haven't done a lot of engagement on that level, but I know that our other programs do and we, uh, it's a super important part, especially of forestry. Um, when I am writing forest plans, I'm talking about the history of the land and what has been done throughout the millennia in terms of management. There aren't, hmm, Ashley, my brain mush is hitting. <laughs> there aren't Native American tribes in represented in Napa County. Fix the sentence. I'm I'm messing up. What there, am I saying? You you are not wrong. There is no tribal land in Napa County, but mm -hmm. there is a tribal council in yes. Napa County. Yes. Thank you, Ashley, for being the working part of my brain. <laughs> so so we consider you know. Obviously, what that means is that the native peoples were kicked off of the lands in Napa County. That you know, this this was definitely native lands before colonialism. So the impact, influence, and ecology of the landscape has been hugely impacted by native peoples. Um, and we, you know, I'm I'm sorry to say that I'm paying mostly lip service in this minute, but it is a hugely important part of any land management. And, and I can sort of elaborate a little bit on that. Um, our Acorns to Oaks program, which is a program that typically runs when school is in a normal session, which who knows when that will be again. We have this really great program called Acorns to Oaks in which we do education about oak woodlands and you know the history of the oak woodlands here. And within that program, the Suskel uh, Intertribal Council is represented. Um, and they are invited to speak and, and be a part of those, um, those different lessons and those different planting days and things like that. So um, 
although maybe maybe Amanda, you haven't quite yet um, broken into that that inner ring. Um, we we do engage with our local um, indigenous folks here. That's great. In the ways that we are able at this point. Yeah. So let's see. I don't think we have any more questions. So this is your last chance, everybody. Amanda is still here. She's still awake. Her brain is mostly still working, and she's ready. She's ready for that last question to filter in. Um, I do want to say, while we're waiting for a question, if, if you don't mind, Amanda, I would like to do a little plug for, um, for our Acorns to Oaks program. Um, mm -hmm. we, we put out a call last week to get people to give us acorns. And what we love about Napa County is that when we ask, you guys really deliver. Um, we asked for acorns thinking, you know, maybe we get a couple of bags and we are currently at about 8,500 acorns. Um, and our goal this year, I think, was about 1,600. So um, we are doing great. Uh, we do still, um, we're thinking that we would like some acorns. If any of you are, that are on this call um, and on, on Facebook right now, um, if you're from the Oak Knoll area, we'd like a couple extra acorns from the Oak Knoll area, Valley Oak in particular. Um, and then any of the areas that are near some of the wildfire affected areas, um, oftentimes, as Amanda mentioned, our oak trees will be fine, um, but we do want to make sure that we have um, some acorns available for folks that, you know, maybe have lost some oak woodlands. So um, if you're anywhere near either the glass or the LMU, um, we, we will happily take your acorns and we'll distribute them out to landowners. So if you're a landowner and you need acorns to help re-oak your property, again, let us know and we can make that happen. We can provide tools and instruction on how to do that. And then NRCS can also come in and look at your land and say, hey, this is where you should put this, this is where you should put this, or don't plant oaks here, you shouldn't do that. So, uh, oh, Peter has a question on Facebook. Uh, what is your favorite tree, Amanda? Oh man, Sequoia Simperverians, the coastal redwood has been my favorite since I was a kid growing up in Sonoma County. Um, and then the rival for my affections these days is uh, Populus nervosa, the, or Tremulotus, sorry, the aspen, quaking aspen of especially the Rockies, but it spreads out a bit. So somewhere, somewhere in heaven, there's a place where redwoods and aspen grow together. And <laughs> that's where I want to go. Thanks. Um, and then to answer Josh's question, where do we deliver acorns? Um, you can deliver them to the Napa RCD office. We are at 1303 Jefferson Street. And we are upstairs in suite 500B. And if nobody's there, um, just leave them outside the door. And um, there is a little piece of paper to fill out so that we know where your acorns are coming from. Um, so we make sure that they get planted in the right area of the county. Um, but there, it's, it's online if you go to NapaRCD.org. Um, there's a little link for collecting acorns. And I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, so I think that we can wrap it up. Um, Amanda, if you have anything else you wanna share with everybody, um, we can call it a night. I just, you know, thanks everyone for bearing with me. I am, um, I'm, I'm really <laughs> just happy that people are interested. So I'm happy to talk, but I, <laughs> I am tired these days. <laughs> Well, thank you, Amanda, for taking the time. And um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And again, if, if you want to share this presentation with other folks that maybe have missed it, um, it'll be available on Facebook right away. And it'll be on our YouTube page probably within the next week or two, probably Ooh. two weeks. Yes, Amanda, Actually, go. Sorry, I do need to give one big plug to Mary Maeda from the Mendocino RCD. She helped me a lot with the slideshow. So thanks. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, we have a lot of uh, thanks coming in for you um, for, you know, having a forester here in Napa County. It's a brand new thing for us. We're very excited to have Amanda here. Um, awesome. we're, we're super thrilled. And um, just thank you, Amanda, for, for being here tonight. I know you've been extremely busy. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure, everyone. Thank you. All right. Well, have a great night, everybody. And it's lovely to see all of your faces and, um, and, and hear your voices. So have a great night. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.